Putting on it right now. Yeah. Okay. Thank, oh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the <coughs> technical difficulties we're having. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody has access to the PDF now. We're gonna do it PDF style so that we can make sure all the slides come through because there's so many photos in it that we need to see them all. I'm Dr. Alita Simmons. I am a dermatologist. I practice here in Nashville. I've been here five years now. Um, I went to Loyola for medical school um, and did my training. <laughs> at Case Western in Cleveland, but I actually went to an HBCU for undergrad. I went to Alabama A&M, and I actually sat in these seats during the Health Careers and Opportunities Program. These are the same seats from 2002. <laughs> um, so I used to sit right there. So I'm, I'm always happy to be back and coming to Meharry. I was just in Morehouse last weekend, so I always come, like coming to visit my HBCUs. This is my email address. I'll also show it again at the end if anybody has any questions about any of the conditions or want to follow up from the lecture. 
So today we're going to talk about how to describe skin lesions, how to take a history in dermatology, and then some of the presentation of common rashes. You're going to see some of these rashes over and over again. Remember that repetition is the key to adult learning. You want to know what normal looks like because patients don't read like the textbook all the time. And so you want to know what normal is so you can see if somebody is falling a little bit outside of that normal uh, presentation because you never know how things may show up and how they may overlap and relate to other conditions. And feel free to stop me during this, this introductory lecture tends to be pretty long. So feel free to stop me, ask questions, and we'll definitely take a break. So descriptions. When you are giving a presentation to an attending, your descriptions matter. In dermatology, you can describe something to us and I can give you a diagnosis just based off the description if it fits that typical pattern. So we wanna know where it's located on the body. We call it distribution. The configuration, like is it grouped? Is it annular? Is it linear? The morphology, is it a macule? Is it a papule? Those are primary lesions. We'll go into those more and break those down. And we want to know the size and the color. So this is a, a framework to ask yourself, just that same thing, but in the pattern. So when I describe a lesion, I may say um, a patient has a red two centimeter nodule with a smooth border on the left leg. Like you wanna just give those words. You, wanna, you don't wanna give too many words, but you kinda, if you practice following this pattern, like the patient um, that has lichen striatus on the leg. I don't know if you can tell from the way it shows up to you, but it's almost purple in color. So you could say a purple linear um, lichen planus can be raised, it's hard to tell here, so I would call it a linear um, thin plaque along the inner, um, see this is probably the, the inner left leg. This, this is something that you could print out and keep in your pocket, especially while you're doing rotations because it's hard to remember when you're first starting out what all these terms mean and which one you want to use. So I would keep something like this in my pocket and before I would present to the attending, I would make sure like, okay, could I feel it? If I can't feel it and it's less than a centimeter, it's a macule. If I can feel it and it's less than a centimeter, it's a papule, it's small. If it's greater than a centimeter and I can feel it, it's a plaque. If it's less than a centimeter and it has a pus in it, it's a pustule, like acne pustules. If it is larger or less, it can be, nodules can be, this is a little confusing because nodules can be small. Um, so they can be greater or less than a centimeter in real life. But they're like a papule, but deeper. They're, there's going to be substance above the skin and below the skin. And then tumors are much larger than nodules. Vesicles have clear fluid in them. It's not going to be white at all. It's going to be completely clear, like in herpes simplex chronicus or zoster. And then a bulla is a fluid-filled lesion that's bigger than a vesicle. It's bigger than one centimeter. This is just another way to look at things. Sometimes we need things in different formats to remember. So if you want to remember it based on if it's raised, flat, depressed. The depressed part, these are more what we call secondary uh, signs or secondary lesions, erosions, ulcers, atrophy in the skin. Atrophy is just a depression in the skin where the skin has gotten thinner. And it, when you rub your hand across it, you can feel that difference. And there may also be a depression associated with it. And then a sinus is basically two areas of the skin that connect to each other. You can feel like a tunnel underneath and that, may, that sinus may drain, like in a condition called hydranitis suprativa. And then striae, which are stretch marks. And then we have our fluid filled uh, section, a furuncle, we'll talk about that later and what that is. And then there are vascular, vascular lesions, telangiectasias, petechiae, and ecchymoses. 
I actually took out the vascular part of this lecture because we went through it last year. The lecture is very long. So I was trying to see where we could cut out things that may not be as important for you guys to know right now. And these are, this is just something else to kind of keep in your pocket. Secondary morphology, serums are crust when rashes weep that fluid that comes onto the skin and it dries up that leaves a crust. Fissures, lichenification, I'll show you a picture of that later, but it's where the skin thickens after chronic rubbing. Erosions, superficial removal of that epidermis, they're not deep. Ulcerations are deeper, they're going beyond the epidermis into the dermis and sometimes the subcutaneous tissue and down and can go down to bone. And scaling happen, often happens in our um, conditions that cause inflammation. Scaling can occur when the conditions are getting better and the inflammation is resolving. And then in terms of distribution, is it on an extensor surface like the elbow, fronts of the knees, like in psoriasis? Generalized distribution is it's pretty much widespread and all over the body. Photodistributive rashes are in areas where the sun can hit patients more commonly. And then is the rash localized? Is it just in one area? These are all things that'll help you describe what's going on. So we're gonna go through some pictures and some diagnoses really quickly before we get into some of the uh, more detailed information. So like I said, macules, you cannot feel. If you close your eyes and rub your finger across it, it's gonna be smooth, you wouldn't know it was there. This is, a, this is a patch, but it's not vitiligo. It, the, the pictures got swapped. But this is more of a, um, a large cafe au lait macule on the chest. It's a patch, it's large, it's greater than a centimeter. If you rub your hand across it, you can't feel it. You can see these small papules on the face. You can see them in molluscum contagiosum. But I wanted to also show you a picture. This is a condition called brooks spiegler And so in brooks spiegler patients can get benign papules scattered on the face. This is a neurofibroma. So in neurofibromatosis, patients can have multiple of these nodules. They're gonna be firm. You can feel it on the top part of the skin, but you can also tell that there's substance underneath it as well. Wheels are urticaria, so urticaria, think hives, the skin is raised. If you looked underneath the microscope, the skin is raised because there's more fluid in there. It's what we call edematous, so you could call this a red edematous plaque, or you could call it red edematous wheels. Either one of those would be fine. These are pustules, and this is pustular psoriasis. So if you have a patient in the clinic and they have psoriasis and you are wanting to get them relief, don't give them prednisone because if you give a patient with psoriasis prednisone and it's abruptly stopped, they can erupt in pustular psoriasis. So if a patient has, has psoriasis, so a lot of times, you know, somebody comes in, a ra comes in with a rash, sometimes your reflex can be, well, let's, let's put you on some oral steroids like prednisone. But in some patients, if you do that in psoriasis, when, that, when prednisone is stopped, they can develop pustular psoriasis. So these pustules scattered all over their body. Usually psoriasis, it, are, they're large scaly plaques, like on the elbows, knees, it can affect the scalp. There are other variants of psoriasis but this form of psoriasis is very concerning. These are vesicles, so fluid-filled um, fluid -filled papules kind of um, grouped together. So that's the key when you're thinking about herpes simplex or zoster. These vesicles are always gonna be grouped together and they always kind of follow a pattern and return in the same place. Yes. Typically when they're larger, greater than a centimeter, we call them a tumor. 
nodules um, are smaller. It's just a size. Sometimes there are masses that are, we also call them like exophytic, like it looks like they're sprouting from the skin because they're so big, but we typically will keep them in the, the nodule for a tumor. And this photo is of a bulla, which is tense, fluid filled, and can happen anywhere on the skin for lots of different reasons, but this is bullous pemphigoid. It's an autoimmune condition where the skin is being attacked, causing these blisters to form underneath the skin. And now we'll talk about secondary morphology. So this is, these are important descriptors. Think of them as adjectives for your primary morphology. Erosion, so this is a patient with um, lupus. Their skin, they had bullous lupus, so the blisters have gone away, but it's left the skin with an erosion. So the epidermis is gone in an erosion. It's superficial. In an ulcer, they can happen in places of pressure. This is a diabetic ulcer that's pretty deep. So you see that we've gone past the epidermis, through the dermis, and into deeper tissues. So ulcers are deeper. And then with herpes zoster, herpes simplex, as the lesions are healing, they crust over. The serum, the fluid from the inside has come out, it's dried, and it leaves a crust over it. I usually, we tell patients when they come in with zoster that you are contagious until all of the lesions crust over, and that's very important. Scale, dry, flaky skin, it usually can easily come off if you were to scrape it. This can be from just plain old dry skin, patients not having moisturizer, or as inflammatory skin conditions heal, the weeping that the skin has had, or that loss of water in the skin comes out and leaves the scale. Fissures are common corners of the mouth with chelitis, usually called by, caused by um, fungal infection, but also people with eczema get fissures a lot on their fingers. The fingers tend, the tips of the fingers tend to crack and split. That's very common, commonly seen in eczema as well. <clears throat> oh, chelitis. Mm -hmm. Chelitis affects the corners of the mouth going to be very frustrating for patients because it tends to come back. These are excoriations seen in acne. Excoriations are basically tr trauma to the skin for whatever reason, whether someone scratched you or you are scratching yourself. This is very common. People like to pick acne, and so we call it acne excoriae, especially when patients have it all over. Striae are stretch marks. They can come anywhere on the body. It's from the skin stretching and going back down um, and vice versa. Very common arms, back, stomach, and the thighs. You can get them when you gain weight and you can get them when you lose weight. It's just the, the, the change in the stretch in the skin. Also, with, um, it's common in teenagers with growth spurts. You know, the kid that was, you know, four, seven, over the summer, they come back to school and they're like, you know, five, seven. They can commonly get stretch marks along the, along the mid back because that, that growth stretch was so dramatic and not gradual, so they develop stretch marks. This is, so I would, these are keloids, hypertrophic scars. There's a little, a little bit of nuance, but you guys don't need to know that, but you might see hypertrophic scar. But basically the large ones are keloids. Lichenification, basically very common in people who have a history of eczema. They've had it for years. The same, it affects the same area, so the so same areas are rubbed or scratched over and over again, and it leads to thickening of the skin and darkening of the skin, 
it may also be some scale there too because patients with eczema don't have a good skin barrier so our skin barrier should be tight like this where we don't lose water but in patients with eczema they're able to lose water that's why the skin is drier and that scale develops because the skin is dry Mm -hmm. So you're going to, it looks similar, but it's different. So she's asking about rashes that diabetic patients can get or pre-diabetic patients can get, and that's acanthosis nigricans. That is, has a more velvety feel. It's not as dry unless the patient also has dry skin as well. But the location is going to be different. The history is going to be different. Acanthosis nigricans doesn't itch. Eczema is itchy. So that's a hallmark of eczema is, par is paritis. And you can see other signs on the skin as well. Some people can get, also get acanthosis nigricans in the axilla or the armpits. So you want to look in other places as well. And patients with eczema are also going to have it in other places too. And you know, you're going to look for those common places and pick that up from the history. We talked about lichen planets before. It's linear. Lichen planets can also have a linear effect because it kebnerizes. I don't know if you've ever heard that word before, but kebnerize means psoriasis and lichen planets. If I have lichen planets on my arm and I tend to scratch, I can make it spread just by scratching it. So trauma to those areas can make it spread. If, when psoriasis is traumatized, it can spread as well. Kebnerization. <clears throat> this is a picture of granuloma annulare. It, we, it has a classic feature. As you can tell, the border, so the border is one thing you want to look at. It's raised and it's in a circular configuration. And we typically call it annular. If it doesn't form a whole circle, you can call it, call it arcuate. And there's a slight depression in the center. Repetition is the key to adult learning. So after you, this lecture, you will know that herpes simplex virus appears in a grouped configuration. Reticular, I think of reticular as just lace-like. So this looks like a lace pattern or the pattern on a doily. This is most likely from somebody using a heating pad and developed erythema ab igni or people can get it on the lower legs when they use um, like a space heater underneath their desk. This is very common, but this can also be seen in other vascular conditions as well. So you may also see a livido pattern. You may say livido, livido reticularis, which is another vascular condition. When you see color, you want to call the color what it is. This is a photo of someone who has post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation from acne, but you can say this patient has brown macules scattered in the areas of prior acne on the cheeks. <clears throat> Hypopigmentation or a lighter color in the skin. Hypopigmentation differs from depigmentation that you would see in vitiligo in that there's still color there. In vitiligo, the color is gone. The melanin is no longer there. The melanocytes have been destroyed by the immune system. And so that's the difference. This is hypopigmentation, just a lighter tone from the normal color of skin versus vitiligo is depigmented. There's no pigment there. And this is pityriasis alba. This is common, especially in kids with eczema. They tend to get hypopigmented um, patches or macules on the face. Green color, we see this in Pseudomonas. This is Pseudomonas affecting the fingernail. Yellow color, we see with jaundice mostly. Yellowing of the skin, yellowing of the eyes. In orange color, people can have an orange color if they have hyperkeratinemia, usually when they have taken in foods that are high in beta carotene. 
purple or violacious. If somebody said, if someone describes something to me and they say it's violacious, I'm automatically going to think about Kaposi sarcoma. It's one of those conditions in dermatology that violacious goes hand in hand with. So it's important to distinguish what that means when something is violation. It's more red, purple in color on the skin. A blue spot would be a cerulean spot. Next week in your solitary lesions lecture, also you a blue nevus. Nevi or moles can also be blue. It just depends on where that pigment is in the skin and how the light hits it. When it reflects back to us, it looks blue. And red, you can, you can say something looks red. Sometimes we say erythematous. But it's, it's fine to say, you know, this eight-month-old child has a confluent red patch across the chest and the abdomen. So let's talk about the history and physical. Has anybody ever done any dermatology exams before on a patient? <laughs> what did you find that's always helpful when you interview a patient with Derm concerns. That was great, Katie. Katie has some derm experience. So the first thing you wanna do is a very thorough history. Just like with any patient, derm is indifferent. Yes, we are a very visual field, but we are investigators. We need to know what you're doing in your free time. You have this random rash. Sometimes rashes can all look the same, but what is gonna distinguish one red scaly patch from another is the history how long has it been there? Have they been exposed to anything? What has the course been? Has it come and stayed? Or has it come, it went away, and it keeps coming back? You know, it has a cycle. And if they had any treatment, what were the treatments and how did they respond to those treatments? You wanna know hobbies? I had a patient, she kept developing these nodules on her fingers. And then there was one in particular that wouldn't go away. I saw her a couple times, and then finally I, I asked her, we had went over her hobbies, but she picked up a new hobby that she didn't mention. She had started back knitting. And so these nodules were from her knitting needles. And had we not gone back over, you know, what else could you be doing that could be causing these nodules, we might not have, might not have figured out what it was. When I was in residency, we had a uh, atopic dermatitis, contact dermatitis clinic and my attending asked the patient, they had a, a, a rash in a weird configuration on the hand. It was kind of across the palm, affecting the inside of one of the fingers. And she asked her, how do you hold your keys? And when she mimicked how she held her keys, it was exactly the distribution of that rash. So you kind of have to you know, put on your investigator hat sometimes to figure out what's going on with patients. You want to know what they do. If a patient is having a frequent rash on the hands, what are you doing with your hands? Hairdressers oftentimes get what we call dishydrotic eczema, which I'll show you a picture of later. It's just from wet to dry cycles, being in the water all the time, washing your hands, drying them, washing your hands, drying them. That can cause people to have a rash as well. Is anybody else itchy and scratching at home? You know, you want to know who else is affected by this because they may have scabies. Medications. Medications can cause everything from hair loss, changes in the nails, to different types of rashes. You know, rashes that we can just stop the medicine and take care of at home, but there are other rashes that need hospital care, which we'll also look at later. And then allergies, are they coming into contact with anything or eating anything that may be causing their rash? And then you wanna make sure you're doing a thorough examination and 
palpating the skin of the involved areas because you really want to know like is this raised or not does it have any substance to it is there any drainage if you're thinking someone has an abscess you know is there fluctuance is there fluid underneath this skin anybody have any questions before we move on to rashes so we kind of dropped the schema in here so you guys will have you know, something to go back to and look at to see how you can distinguish different types of rashes. So first we'll start with eczema. Some people will use the word dermatitis. You may see that interchangeably. It can be localized, generalized, or based on a pattern of contact like we talked about before. Atopic dermatitis, most commonly diagnosed in childhood. Typically adults aren't we don't have a lot of adult onset atopic dermatitis. Typically people are, are diagnosed by the age of two. Usually in adult, I'm thinking contact dermatitis, like what are you coming into? Do you have a new allergy? To meet criteria, there are major and minor, but definitely have to have pruritus, which is itching, like I talked about before, eczema is going to itch. It can be present in the creases, like the flexural parts of the body, the antecubital fossa, the popliteal fossa, and around the eyes. Patients can also have what we call Denny Morgan lines, where they're just lines or creases underneath the eyes. And if they have a history of atopy, so what is that? They have a personal or family history of hay fever or bad seasonal allergies or asthma. This is a diagram for stepwise care for atopic dermatitis. We go up based on severity. The hallmark of treatment for atopic dermatitis is skin care. We gotta make sure patients are, know how to take care of their skin and that they are using a good emollient, like something that's gonna moisturize their skin, taking short, lukewarm showers, patting dry, leaving a little water on the skin, then putting their emollient on. Um, and if they have a medication topically, put that on afterwards. But we have lots of new medications in dermatology now to treat atopic dermatitis, um, which is great because patients really suffer. Seborrheic dermatitis, I typically will show a picture of the scalp, but I like people to also think about involvement on the face. Severic dermatitis on the scalp and the face is going to be flaking, itching. On the face, you may see hypopigmentation, so a lighter skin color. It could be around the frontal hairline. You may see small scaly patches that come down onto the forehead. And then, especially around the nasolabial folds, it can affect the complete nose itself, not just the creases, and also come onto the cheeks. And you distinguish this from rosacea and brown skin because rosacea and brown skin can present with hypopigmented patches on the central face as well, but it's not, rosacea is not going to have the scale associated with it, where seborrheic dermatitis is going to have scale or flaking. This is dyshydrotic eczema on the hands. It can also affect the feet. So if the I think you guys can see those papules. They, they're a little, uh, you can get little papules and vesicles on the fingers and the palms. It's important to distinguish whether it's a vesicle or a pustule, because if you see pustules, you have to think about psoriasis. Dyshydrotic eczema is vesicles. Psoriasis on the hands and feet can show up as pustules. And we have to be creative sometimes with how we treat it on the hands because it's hard because we have to wash our hands and keep them clean, but there's a balance. And some people may need to take their own personal soap, you know, without any fragrance or certain preservatives that can trigger eczema, like take it with them to different places because using the wrong thing can make people flare. Now we'll talk about rashes that we get on the lower legs. Numular dermatitis, round, coin-shaped, they may be scattered, it may be solitary, like on the leg of this person. It's gonna be really itchy. 
but the treatment is pretty much still the same. There can be an overlap. So if patients have atopic dermatitis, it's typically going to be around the eyes, can be around the mouth, it can be the cheeks, neck, like the flexural areas, flexures on the arms and on the legs. But some people have eczema that is more generalized. It may be face, trunk, arms, and legs more widespread. But then there are types that like dyshydrotic eczema that you're just going to see on the hands and the feet you won't see those vesicles like on the other parts of the body. But there are types of eczema that are, some kids may just have follicular prominence. So think about your hair follicles and those hair follicles having tiny bumps on, on them. They're flesh colored, or I, I should say tiny papules. They're flesh colored, but that goes along with having eczema. It's kind of part of the, the eczema picture. Presentation, history. Mm -hmm. Asteatotic dermatitis. Think about it as a dry riverbed. These look looks like a riverbed that has not had seen water in a while. So mostly this is in elderly people. Water loss in the skin is common as we age, and so moisturization is more important. Sometimes we don't only need like a moisturizer, but we need something with acid in it to help lift that scale and really get, get the skin moisturized. And this is typically seen on the lower legs, but it's also common like on the, on the forearms um, of elderly patients as well. Stasis dermatitis is something you, are, you guys are always gonna see. In the hospital, it's gonna be stasis dermatitis and cellulitis. People like to confuse the two. Stasis dermatitis typically is going to affect both legs. It's usually in people who have cardiovascular disease, especially congestive heart failure, because the fluid is pooling in their legs. When the skin stretches, it itches, it turns red, it becomes irritated. We also would call that erythema. And it can be painful when it stretches. And when the skin is stretching and itching, it can also lead to fissures erosions and ulcers in the skin. So what we need to do is have patients elevate their legs, do compression to help push that fluid back up to the heart, topical steroids for any uh, skin symptoms they're having, exercise and medical fluid management. So you would work with primary care in order to really get this condition under control. And remember, cellulitis is gonna be most likely unilateral, one leg, because it's from infection. It's less likely that you're gonna have both legs infected unless some, a trauma happened to both legs, right? So there's something happening to usually that one limb that's causing infection there, where stasis dermatitis is typically gonna affect both legs, sometimes one leg more than the other. Lichen simplex chronicus, we've seen that in the other uh, photo of atopic dermatitis, but it's Hyperpigmented, thickened skin on a place on the body due to chronic rubbing or scratching. It's very itchy. It can be very frustrating to treat. It, we usually start with topical steroids. Sometimes we have to do topical steroids under occlusion, like where the patient puts on the medication and then wraps their skin so that the medication can penetrate better because this is thick, so we're not getting to where we need to go. Sometimes I'll even do injected steroids into the area because it's localized and I can just try to treat it that way. And that typically typically helps. But patients really need to do some behavioral change to try to stop scratching because it's that constant itch scratch cycle that goes on and on. Stasis dermatitis is typically bilateral, whereas cellulitis is typically unilateral, right? 
So that can save you doing a derm consult on your medicine rotation when the attending is like, oh, well, we should call derm. You can say, actually, I think this is stasis dermatitis because, or this is cellulitis because. It is, it is, mm -hmm. We typically see it in eczema, but you can see it in other things too. So now we'll talk about some generalized patterns. A patient comes in with a severe eczema flare. <clears throat> We're gonna want to get them better pretty quickly because this patient is miserable. I'll typically do, so we can do oral steroids or we can do what we call wet wraps. Wet wraps is where you take an ointment of a topical steroid. You have patients put it all over their body, take, a, take wet um, towels or uh, wet sheets, wrap themselves in it, and then they would wrap themselves in something that's dry and warm. And they would sit in that for like an hour or two. Remove it, but don't take the medicine off. That typically helps the inflammation uh, su uh, subside from the body over a certain period of days. Also, if a patient is typically having flares that are more generalized over and over again, you, they need to be on something oral or e either an injectable or oral biologic medication. Let's talk about drug eruptions. You can tell this patient has mixed hyperpigmentation and red coalescing patches on the abdomen. Usually when you have a drug eruption, it's going to be usually neck down, right? They're going to, it's going to affect the body more so the face. But we're going to look at one where we do have some facial involvement that can be um, pretty concerning. Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. If patients are suspected to have this, they need to be transferred to a burn unit. Their skin literally is sloughing off. We, we call it Nikolsky sign. You put pressure on the skin and that skin just rubs off. There's mucosal involvement. So the eyes, nose, mouth, genital area, the rectal area, you need to check all those areas for involvement. And then everybody needs to be consulted pretty much based on where the patient has involvement for a good thorough workup of those areas because patients, patients can die when they have these conditions, so it's very serious. Common causes are medications, and then they're classified based on their involvement of the skin. So less than 10%, we call it SJS. Greater than 30, we usually call it TEN, and in the middle, we just call it kind of an overlap. But these patients need to be um, washed very closely um, in a more skilled unit. So this is dress syndrome or drug hypersensitivity syndrome. The hallmark of this is a facial swelling. Patients tend to have significant swelling in addition to rash on the body. They can have multi-organ failure. And if they, you know, patients do well, come out of the hospital, they still need to be monitored, especially with their thyroid. Patients can develop hypothyroidism um, after the rash is over. And they seem to be doing fine. That's something that should be monitored. Patients are gonna be ill, fever, they're gonna have swollen lymph nodes. So this is definitely, um, can be a prolonged hospital stay. And it can happen in kids too, so don't forget about your kiddos that might come in with facial swelling and a rash. You wanna make sure they don't have this condition. Drug-induced lupus is common. Okay, so the question is, can patients get this condition if they, are, if they have certain medical conditions and are started on these medicines, or can anybody get it that takes these medicines? Is that correct? Yeah. Anybody can get it that takes these medicines, but there are some gene correlations. 
in some of these drug rashes where people may be more susceptible um, to developing certain drug rashes, but you don't need to know, you don't, that's something you don't need to know right now, those genes, but yes, some people can have a genetic disposition to it. That's a great question. Drug-induced lupus in um, dermatology, minocycline is the most common one that we prescribe where we see patients develop lupus-like symptoms. I usually don't prescribe a lot of minocycline. I usually go to doxycycline because we don't really see those side effects with doxycycline. And I'm typically prescribing those things for acne or folliculitis. Um, but it could happen with lots of different drugs. So you just want to make sure when you're starting a patient on a new drug at their follow-up, you're asking them about any symptoms they're having. That's why that review of symptoms is important. And that should be anti-TNF alpha inhibitors. It just separated the two lines. And then contact dermatitis, which is what we've talked about before and just the pattern. So poison ivy, you see how it also looks a little linear? If you scratch poison ivy, it's going to spread. So you want to be cautious with scratching it because it's, it can move to other, you scratch poison ivy on your leg, scratch your arm, you may transfer it and it is very uncomfortable. Patients uh, need to be on more prolonged doses of oral steroids to get it to calm down. We've been going for about 45 minutes. Let's take a break. <laughs> so let's do like around a five minute break and then we'll get, we'll get started back. See if I can um, turn this off.
right, you guys ready to get started again? That's a good question because it's all over the internet. <laughs> she asked about topical steroid withdrawal. Topical steroids have to be used in a certain way. So let's say you're using a topical steroid every single day, not taking a break, and it's been months, over a year. I've seen people using topical steroids every day for years before. If you've been on a steroid that long, you have to be weaned off right? If you just stop a topical steroid after you've been using it that long, you, you can flare in terms of having a rash. So you have to wean down. Let's say if someone's on a high potency topical steroid like clobetazole. Clobetazole is um, pretty strong, but I use it all the time. You can use steroids all the time if you know how to prescribe them and can do it safely. I would have that patient actually, if they're using it twice a day, every day, I would have them drop down to once a day. And then slowly take them, slowly take them down. But I would also add in a steroid that's like medium potency, let's say like triamcinolone, and transition them to that to get them down on the potency. So I would get them to a, a lower potency I, would, I even may go down to like a hydrocortisone 2.5% depending on how long they've been on the steroid and if transitioning them, they're starting to flare. So I have to, you kind of have to balance it, but people definitely have to be weaned off slowly if they've been using steroids for a, a long period of time. So typically when we use steroids, we're using them for short periods of time. I usually tell my patients, I want you to use this twice a day for two weeks if it's on the body. If you're not better, let me know. I give them small amounts so it's not like they have enough to keep them going to use it, you know, overuse it. And then different locations of the, of the body are going to matter too. Let's say a patient has a rash on the face or they have severe dermatitis and it's a bad flare. I only want people to use it for five to seven days. Steroids on the face for long periods of time can cause people to have steroid-induced acne, steroid-induced rosacea, perioral dermatitis, which we'll see a picture of later. So we have to use topical steroids in a, in a safe manner, but I think what happens is patients aren't educated when they get their medications. You have to really talk to your patients about how to use things you know, give people something written so that they can remember. Uh, and sometimes I will, well, in my chart, I can copy paste my prescription and put it in their note because sometimes when patients pick up their prescriptions from the pharmacy, it just says use as directed. The, the patient has no idea what you told them, <laughs> like none. So it's important to reiterate, like, this is for two weeks. I want you to use this for two weeks and stop. Or this is for, you know, three to four weeks and then stop. So that patient education piece is very important, and which is why we see things like steroid withdrawal. You're, if you stop a steroid cold turkey after using it for so long, yes, you can have a, you can have a flare. But steroids are fine in the, in the right hands and with education. All right, ready to go through some more rashes? So papulosquamous is just a term that we use. Uh, you don't have to think anything about it or remember it. More so, I want you to just remember uh, what these rashes look like and some of their names. So you can say, I've seen this before. As a first year medical student, that's all you need. And you know, as you're learning, I've seen this before in my Durham lecture, I can go back and find it somewhere. Let's look at psoriasis. Psoriasis is known for, in lighter skin types, pink, 
scaly papules and plaques, as you can see on the back of this uh, person. You can see it on their elbows, top of the shoulders, and throughout the back. And then on the right, in, <clears throat> in skin types, um, in black and brown people, that pink color isn't always there. You may just see that white, thick scale. You can see here on the elbows and the lower back. Psoriasis can come in all shapes, forms, and sizes. There's a type of psoriasis called guttate psoriasis where patients get almost like you threw it at them, right? It's like scattered all over the back and the front part of the trunk. And it usually comes after a strep infection. Somebody's had strep throat and strep throat is their trigger for developing psoriasis. Psoriasis can also come from trauma. It could be a sunburn. Um, it's also a, an immune-based um, condition. There's multiple pathways, and we've learned from those pathways how to have how to treat psoriasis. So there are lots of different psoriasis treatments out there right now, which is great. Other things we also treat it with topical steroids, vitamin D analogs. Light makes psoriasis better. So patients may say, in the summertime, my psoriasis is good. Right? They're getting more sun exposure, but in the wintertime, they flare. So narrow band UVB is a type of light box we can put patients in and treat them two to three times a week for their psoriasis to calm down. And then, like I said, there are biologic medications. Whenever I see a patient with psoriasis, I always check their hands and their feet. I'm checking for these nail pits. Sometimes they can have these yellow spots in their nails too, called oil spots. And then um, also I'm looking for signs of arthritis. Are their fingers or their toes swollen? They can get what we call sausage digits, and those are signs of psoriatic arthritis. So we also work hand-in-hand -hand with rheumatology and a lot of germ conditions too. Like in Plantis, you've seen that already, purple polygonal papules. If you have a test, purple polygonal papules is always like in Plantis. Most common, I always like to show the wrist and the forearm because that's where it typically comes. It can also be on the legs. There are different types of lichen planus. It can be bullous, um, where people, it can be ulcerative, where I had a patient in residency where she just got these ulcers on her feet, and she also had, like, um, had previously had lichen planus that presents normally, but what was happening on her feet was lichen planus causing ulcerations. I always like to look in the mouth of patients with lichen planus because they can have what we call uh, like a white patch on the buccal mucosa. And you wanna watch that because that can be an area where patients develop squamous cell skin cancer. And then we don't know why some people get it. There have been cases where patients have hepatitis C. And so sometimes we'll screen patients for that just depending on their history. Bitteriasis rosea. So if you see that the larger uh, patch on the side, that is what we call a herald patch. That's usually the first sign, like that shows up first, and then patients get smaller macules that are scattered on the trunk. And this is typically pityriasis rosea. It can ha mostly happens in kids, it can be viral related. It's not contagious. Parents typically are worried about it because of its appearance, but you just reassure them tell them that it will go away on its own. We only treat it if patients are having itching. We wanna treat um, the paritis if it's there. And you'll also, you also may see it described as a Christmas tree pattern on the back. It's hard for me to really see the Christmas tree pattern, but you know, if you squint your eyes and pretend, you can see it sometimes. Tinea, tinea can affect any part of our body. It's a dermatophyte infection. When you see this, you wanna treat it and you wanna make sure nobody else in the house has it, especially with um, tinea capitis. Kids, if they're sharing pillows, sharing beds, sharing blankets, they can pass it to one another. Definitely tinea capitis needs oral treatment. And the common cause of recurrence in children is not having a high enough dose. So dosing has to be appropriate for kids because if the dose is not high enough, it's not gonna get rid of the condition and it can get really severe on the scalp. And then tinea corporis is on the body. Commonly people say they think they have a ringworm. 
you can see it's scaly on the edges. It has what we call like a trailing scale. And then we treat it with topical and oral antifungals. Very common on the feet and the growing. Sometimes patients who have recurrent tinea cruis, I will ask them, you know, to make sure they, we also may have to make sure we treat their feet. And when they put their clothes on, put your socks on first, then put your, then put your underwear on and your pants on. Because if you have tinea pedis and you put it on your, your underwear and your pants and they're rubbing your feet, you might be just transferring tinea from the feet to the groin. So that's just like, just a little tip. Secondary syphilis, we call it the great mimicker because syphilis can look like all types of things. Like this is what we may commonly see, but syphilis can masquerade as other things. You, it could look like any other normal type of rash that you've seen. So a patient who's not responding to typical treatment, think about syphilis. You typically wanna see the palm involvement, we call it like copper pennies on the palms where they're like red, brown, uh, macules scattered on the palms. They may have rash on the body as well. You want to make sure that you are very diligent with treating these patients and making sure that they um, are fully treated because it's very contagious. I, when I examine patients, I put on gloves. I, you know, I had a doctor tell me once, you, you never know what you might be touching you walk in the room and you, you know, examine and touch this rash with your bare hands, you, you may give yourself syphilis doing that. So just be cautious when you examine people. You know, we have protective equipment for a reason. Um, and in dermatology, you just, you just never know what's about to happen in the room or what somebody's about to show you. So just stay ready with some gloves. Discoid lupus. Anybody know who that singer is? Okay, great. I was like, will they know who Seal is? I don't know. <laughs> Discoid lupus um, is very debilitating. I had a patient who pretty much lost the majority of the hair on his scalp from scarring from discoid lupus. When it heals, like on Seal's face, that is healed. He has those leftover scars from where he had active disease. But when the disease is active, it's red. It's usually you want to check the ears, it's in the conchal bowl, that's a very common place, scalp, the face, but it can come, you know, anywhere on the body. And we treat it with steroids. If it's localized, you know, you can do topical or injected steroids. Some patients need to be on hydroxychloroquine to treat it. And 5% of patients are going to develop systemic lupus erythematosus. So you want to do a good history and physical to find out if they're having any other symptoms that might think you have lupus. As, they may have lupus as well. But we often describe these as annular because they're more round in shape. Erythema migrans. This is important to see because it looks different in different skin types. We call it like a, like a target. You see the, the bullseye in the middle, you have normal skin color around the bullseye and then the red annular lesion around that. But in brown skin, it's not gonna be as prominent, but that bullseye feature is still there. So you wanna look closely. It's always important to look at skin, con skin conditions in different skin tones so you can get comfortable with how they may present differently. Erythema in brown skin is gonna look very different than um, erythema and lighter skin. You, it may be more purple in color, but you wanna get used to what looks normal and what's abnormal. The more normal you see, you can pick up on abnormal better, but you wanna make sure you're tuning your eyes into that. And so erythema migraines is from the tick. Um, usually about a week after the bite, patients will develop the rash. You wanna treat it with doxycycline Kids under six or pregnant women, you want to do amoxicillin just to protect the teeth because doxy can affect um, the teeth in, um, in young kids. Doxycycline has been used in kids that are younger for shorter periods of time, but for like just guideline purposes, I kind of just keep it there. And so now we're going to talk about things that can be more pustular. 
acne. I think we probably have all seen lots of different acne, especially if you're on social media, it's everywhere <laughs> in terms of treatments, people talking about it and it being popular. But we have different ways it can present on the skin. Acne is a disease of the hair follicle. People can get whiteheads or blackheads. So whiteheads are the closed comedone and um, blackheads are the open ones. Like they're open to the skin, they look black. Papules, which are, papules are gonna be either flesh colored, or they can be red, or they can even have hy be hyperpigmented or brown. And then pustules, we saw before with that picture of pustular psoriasis. A pustule is just a papule that has a pus filled in it. And then cysts are, people say I, have, I get cystic acne. What they're saying is that they get painful nodules on the lower part of their face associated with their acne. And we treat acne based on severity. And so this is just a, a, a picture of the different types of acne and how it can show up, but what it looks like underneath the skin. Treatment algorithms. There are lots of different ways to treat acne. Most of the time, people aren't on just one thing for their acne, they're on multiple things. The only time somebody is usually on one treatment for acne is when they're on Accutane or Isotretinoin. I love retinoids, they're my go-to, but I'm also using other things depending on the type. If they have more inflammation of the skin, they definitely need to be on an oral or a topical antibiotic with that. You can mix and match. All acne is hormonally driven, but for people who, when their hormone cycle, especially with the menstrual cycle, if acne is more prominent during that time, you need to target the hormone receptors in the skin. Hormone receptors in the skin cause us to have hair loss, hair growth on the chin, and acne on the lower cheeks, chin, and neck area. And treatments that we use for those are spironolactone. Spironolactone is a blood pressure medication, but it has anti-androgen effects, and that's why it's effective in acne. And then another one that's newer is Clascoderone. You may have seen commercials for Winlevy. That is a topical medication patients use twice a day if they have acne that is worse around uh, fluctuations in hormones. Birth control is also another um, good option for patients. And then also we have some alternatives that we can add in, like our topical washes with salicylic acid, glycolic acid, azelaic acid, which also helps with hyperpigmentation. And then other antibiotic washes like benzoyl peroxide. So there's, lot, there's lots of ways to treat acne. It's an art. Um, it's not as easy. At, sometimes, as you may think, it would be easy to treat acne because everybody is different and everybody's skin is going to present differently and need different things. Rosacea. So rosacea affects the central face. So when I say central face, I mean the glabella area, the nose, the medial cheeks, and the chin, it can be just based on having blood vessels that are making people red. Pa people can also have these acne-like lesions, like in these photos. Patients may have rhinophyma. Rhinophyma is where the nose becomes disfigured. It's almost like the nose is built up, like, a, like it overgrows. Th that's a sign a patient has um, rosacea as well. In your history, you always wanna ask about triggers. When you get hot, do you turn red? Ask them if they drink alcohol, coffee, or tea, what happens when they drink it? If they get red, hot, flush, that may be a sign. Beer or wine, like the sulfates in the wine, they can make patients stuffy, make them more red. That's a sign of rosacea too. So you wanna kinda ask about all those triggers to see if they have them. I also ask them about their eyes because patients can get ocular rosacea where their eyes feel gritty but that's all um, based on the blood vessels as well. Patients have more prominent blood vessels and they're more red. Perioral dermatitis typically occurs from patients are using a nasal spray, an oral inhaler, or they may be using a topical steroid on the skin. And that can lead to this. 
or patients can just develop it and we, and we don't know why they haven't been using a steroid. We also may call it peri or official, just meaning that it's around the eyes, around the nose, or around the mouth. And we wanna to use topical oral antibiotics to treat this condition. And it can take six weeks or more for it to get better. So you, know, you really have to handhold patients to let them know it's gonna take some time. And then we're moving into some of the more infectious causes of rashes. Here we have folliculitis. See that the kind of reddish purple color that's more of erythema? The hair follicles are inflamed. You may, have, they, you may see pustules or just papules at the base of the hair follicle. It's usually caused by staph. It can be caused by other things. You know, I don't know if you ever heard people say don't shave your legs and get into a hot tub or something like that because you can get folliculitis on the legs that's usually caused by pseudomonas. And folliculitis is treated with topical antibiotics depending on how localized it is or oral antibiotics based on the severity. Impetigo. So it may be hard to see some of the honey crusting as we see in lighter skin types, but if you look right underneath this child's nose, you can see some of that yellowish looking crust. That is a sign of impetigo. It's contagious, it's usually due to staph or strep, and you wanna treat this. For like small areas, you could treat with like topical mupirocin, which is a topical antibiotic, or patients may need an oral antibiotic if it's more severe. And sometimes patients can also get bullous impetigo Impetigo doesn't always occur just on the face. Many textbook pictures will show you pictures of the face, but it can happen on other areas of the body as well. Furuncle or carbuncle, so furuncle is singular. Multiple furuncles would mean you have carbuncles. <laughs> this always confused me in residency. I just would just say they have a boil <laughs> because I couldn't remember, but furuncles are singular but they're basically boils in the skin. You can see this in lots of different conditions, especially hydradenitis, and you wanna treat them when they're solitary with, this may even, you may even need, if it's a singular one, like an IND, where it's like you use um, like a 15 or 11 blade to you know, poke a hole in it to get the contents out to help it heal better. You may want to do a uh, steroid injection to get the inflammation to calm down. There's multiple ways you can treat them. Um, but if you are concerned about something more severe, like hydratinitis suppurativa, that takes, um, that takes more in-depth treatment and long-term uh, monitoring. Incision and drainage. Candidiasis. This is um, important to know. So the top picture, I had a patient in the hospital doing consults when I was a resident, and I'd, I'd never seen candidiasis on the buttocks before and what that might look like. So it, it definitely looked like this. It's like a pink confluent patch involving like the gluteal cleft coming onto the buttocks. And then there are what we call satellite papules, so red papules scattered around that patch, just like you see in that photo. That's very classic. If you see that, you want to think about a candidal infection, and you want to test it just to make sure. Also, it can happen in the skin folds. Many people get what we call intertrigo, or you know, yeast infection underneath the skin folds, or um, candida, and you want to make sure that patients or on treatment for that and they have constant treatment because in skin folds people sweat right what candida and yeast what they love are dark warm places tinea they all love it so you want to make sure patients keep those areas clean and dry and medicated either with a medicated cream or a powder or kind of have patients play with it to see what they like better but definitely it needs to be kept under control because it can it can get worse This is our picture of cellulitis. What's the first thing that you notice in this photo? What's the difference in that one leg? Yep, it's bigger, it's swollen. What color is it? Mm -hmm. So you wanna think about infection. This, what is this not? What is this? 
Yes, this is not stasis dermatitis. <laughs> we want to think about infection, and we want to get this patient on oral or IV antibiotics based on what their other symptoms are. Necrotizing fasciitis. This is that flesh-eating bacteria. It can be, you know, multiple bacteria can play a role in this at the same time. It spreads quickly. This is an emergency. Erysipelas is like cellulitis. It can happen on different parts of the body, but commonly we can see it on the face. It's like cellulitis, but it's deeper. It can feel hard and firm. It's usually caused by strep, and that infection can also be in like the lymphatic system. So this is also, you know, patients will be in the hospital for this too. I've seen it where it also kind of like spreads back to the ear, which is super painful for patients. Okay, we got a few more. Urticaria or wheels. They're raised, so it's like the edema in there. It's a hypersensitivity reaction. People can get urticaria for all different reasons. It can be spontaneous. It can be due to heat. So if I work out, I, get, I break out into hives. It's just because my body is overheated, you get hives, like cholinergic urticaria. Some people can get hives when they're cold. Um, it can be acute or chronic. So you break out, if you break out into hives, they should go away within 24 hours. But if somebody is having hives and they are persistent beyond 24 hours, like that, those same spots, it's hard for patients sometimes to tell if one particular area has stayed and went away and then they got a new spot. So it's, that can be hard to tease out. But you want to distinguish if they're, they're, the wheels are coming and staying or are they coming and going in 24 hours? Because if they come and stay, we have to think about a type of vasculitis called urticarial vasculitis, which will require biopsies and a workup to see why the patient may be developing that. And then acute hives, you had episodes of hives that are coming and going, but it stopped in less than six weeks. Chronic urticaria, longer than six weeks need um, more monitoring and we need to see how we need to treat it. The first line is antihistamines and getting people on good doses. You know, a typical dose of an antihistamine is once a day, but I'll put people on, you know, up to four times a day if needed to try to get their symptoms to calm down. And then there are other medications like um, Zolair, which is an injectable medication for people who have chronic hives that are not going away with the typical treatments. Erythema multiforme is another condition that almost looks like a target, commonly on the hands, but it can occur on other parts of the body, usually viral related like HSV, but lots of other viruses and drugs can cause it too. When you see patients with this, a, um, a good history is important and you wanna monitor them. This can also be bullous and painful. So there are different forms of erythema multiforme Sometimes you can see this as a part of like erythema multiforme, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Erythema nodosum are erythematous uh, plaques on the lower legs. They can also feel nodular. So some of them may not feel um, like thin plaques, but they may have substance underneath um, where we classify them as nodules. They can be seen, it can be seen in lupus or other autoimmune conditions, sarcoid, tuberculosis, strep, and Crohn's disease. They're gonna be tender for patients, uh, sometimes really painful and affecting the way that they walk, rest, treating their underlying condition, and even NSAIDs can, can help. Staph scalded skin. It's something that you may not see very commonly. I've only seen it one time, but you can see there can be differences in presentation depending on at what phase of the disease um, patients are coming in, but it's basically where the skin is sloughing off, like they're losing the epidermis. It can be painful to the touch, and it's usually from an infection like staph, and um, you wanna give these patients oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics as well.
we made it. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Shingles is a is dermatomal. Um, HSV too. HSV will also come to the same place, you know, over and over again. So shingles is usually unilateral on one side in one location, following that dermatome map, unless a patient is um, immunosuppressed. Immunosuppressed patients can have. Um, have it on both sides or have it more generalized where they have zoster all over the body. So if a patient is immunosuppressed, you still want to think about zoster. That's a great question. I, I forgot the name of the section already, but it's like a target break. Um, but, um, Erythema multiforming? Yes. Um, is there any on the lines of it's like the same Not that it's the same, but when you read in the textbooks, you people can have erythema multiforme lesions with some of the same causes. Almost like you can see these lesions in Stevens Johnson's too. Um, so you can kind of look for them. Mm -hmm. You, you want to ask about recent illness, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting. Um, see if they have some type of prodrome of viral illness because that can, that can um, be a trigger. Anybody else? Thank you guys for your attention.